Hi everyone, welcome to another session with the Bauer Reason Repair Center. Today, we are joined by Bicycle Garden, Chris and Susie, here at Bicycle Garden in, uh, what is it called? Sydney Park Cycling Center. Sydney Park Cycling Center. Um, they're going to be talking about basic bike stuff today. They're going to be talking about um, basically kind of the sort of thing if you're looking for uh, a new bike or you, you're finding one at the Bauer or somewhere. They're going to explain it better than I do. Um, but here they are. Thanks, James. Good luck. Uh, so, I'm Chris. I'm Susie. Welcome to the Bicycle Garden. We're in beautiful Sydney Park. Uh, we want to start today off with an acknowledgement of country. So we ride and repair our bikes on the Gadigal land of the Eora people. We pay our respects to leaders past, present, and emerging. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, and we just want to start with a bit of philosophy on what we do. Did you want to talk about it a bit? Uh, yeah, I might need the notes though. Sure. Uh, okay, so yeah, we like to use the um, analogy of martial arts training is every bike mechanic starts as a white belt. So everyone starts with little to no knowledge and skills up as they go um, with more, you know, more time spent on bikes, the more you're going to learn. Um, so yeah, every mechanic starts out knowing nothing and gathers information on their mechanical journey. Um, so bikes are humbling, no matter how much of an experienced mechanic you are, there's always something to learn. So we try and take that philosophy into every session that we run here, um, yeah, to keep that kind of an open mind. Yeah, and that everyone starts somewhere, so we'll all get there on our journey. Yeah. Um, and just want to preface that we, um, we're looking at bikes that come into um, our co-op and into the Bower. We run open workshops here and take in donation bikes. Um, and we do workshops with the Bower. Um, and so we see a lot of dusty old bikes. Um, and we're going to try and talk about uh, some tips to uh, just work on those and it's sort of a general overview because there are so many uh, new innovations in the bike world. There's a million different variations with bikes so it's just a bit of a general overview. If you have specific questions please pop them into the questions uh, to the comments below and beautiful Shane will read them out for us uh, and if you want to do a one-on-one -on -one session there'll be one happening in two weeks with Bauer with Stu and Kieran so book into that. So all that being said should we get into it? Yeah, let's okay. do it. So let's start with some basic bike identification to know what you have. Yeah. So what do we have here? Yeah, so um, this is a mountain bike. Um, identification's handy for um, knowing if a bike's going to be suitable for the type of riding that you want to do. Um, so we're just going to talk about some physical attributes that can kind of help you identify bikes. So if you're just looking at a bike that you find or, you know, picked up on you know, council cleanup or whatever, here's some identifying um, features. So Yeah, it also helps with sizing because it's a little yeah. bit different depending on the type of bike you have. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, this would be classified as a mountain bike. Um, general um, identifiers would be knobbly tires, like larger knobblier tires. Um, let's do our new setup let's just real quick. Let's yeah, let's get a close up in there of that. Look at that. Ooh. Those knobbly tires. Yeah, so you can see there's a, a lot of uh, tread on there. Um, so that's good for gripping like loose and gravelly terrain. Um, other features would be the sloping top tube. That's generally a bit of a general feature of mountain bikes. What does that mean? Uh, so you can see the angles of these, of these tubes are kind of both angling down towards the back of the bike. Um, as opposed to just straight across. Yeah, as opposed to straight across, which we'll cover in um, road bikes. And we also have mountain bikes uh, tend to have more straight handlebars, so you won't see any of the drop bars on these. They're always straight ones across like this. As well, you usually see, uh, or you can see, shocks, um, kind of spring suspension here in the front. Yeah. And sometimes you have them in the back area here for your saddle so you can bounce a bit when you're on them to keep it really comfy so that's sort of a, a nice thing about mountain bikes is they're they are very comfortable they have all these comfort yeah. um, things included in them mm -hmm. um, and generally a lot of gears a lot of yeah. easy lower gearing um, to sort of handle the mountainous terrain yeah you'll see you always see more usually you'll see more than one chain ring in the front um, and you'll see lots in the back 
Should we look at road bikes? Yeah. Let me just grab one. <laughs> Quick swap. So what is that thing you're using there? So this is our stand. Yeah, so this is a nice uh, mobile park tool stand that can keep the bike lifted off the ground so it's much easier to work on things. Um, it's a good option to just having them upside down, which a lot of people do uh, when they're working on bikes at home, which is also fine, um, but it just makes it that bit easier. It also lifts it up to your eye level so it's much more ergonomic, so that's one of the benefits to coming in to use the workshop is you get access to tools like this that uh, make it easier on your body Yeah, and just easier to work on stuff. So, you want to talk about the road bike? Uh, yeah, sure. So, like we were talking about tubes before, um, that's what we call the parts of the bike frame that are made out of these cylindrical uh, steel tubes. Uh, so, this is the top tube, and generally with road bikes, it's quite um, horizontal, sorry, yeah, parallel to the road almost. So, it's a flat bar along the top. Um, so, you get a bit, a bit more of a sort of the two triangle shapes. Um, you can also call this a diamond frame because the two triangles together kind of make up a diamond. So generally not always, um, but a lot of sort of traditional road bikes have this really high top tube. So that's one good indicator. Yeah, the other thing, you can see a big difference here is the bars. Um, road bikes can have what are called drop bars. So they have this curled shape down, your hands sit much lower, you're in a much more um, aggressive leaning forward position. Um, they can also, you can have a, a variety of different handlebars on road bikes, so you can have the flat riser bars, uh, which we have some here. So something might have more, more of a riser bar there. Which we often, is a, a common upgrade we do in the shop is we take off these drop bars and put little riser bars because we find that they're a bit safer to ride, so you can actually sit upright with your hands on the brakes while you're riding, which is quite nice. Um, you can do, there's like variations on that, um, riser bars, straight bars, sweep back, um, yeah. Anything in there? Yeah, so road bikes you get quite a range of bar positions. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, and then the tires are usually quite narrow or narrower, they don't have as much tread, um, because, and the wheel sizes are larger. As well, the gears, um, especially with older ones, they tend to be quite hard, so they're meant to go fast, So, which is another good reason to upgrade these ones to put them on more um, easier gears, a wider range of gears, um, so that you can see that with these, the, the gear block is much smaller, so you're getting, um, you, it's harder to pedal, but you go faster when you're going. Um, and yeah, you can have variation in the front, um, as well in the back sometimes. This is what you'll see single speeds or fixies where you only have one gear or a fixie where you um, you can't coast, you can't go backwards, you have to pedal the whole time. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's probably for road bikes. bikes. And again, there's lots and lots of different kinds of road bikes, but mainly what we see here and at the Bauer is like old steel frames, which are fantastic bikes still, especially when you say upgrade or modernize some of the parts. These have old steel wheels which are very durable but kind of heavy, maybe don't Not break that well in the, rain, yeah. in the wet so we often like a good upgrade would be to say an alloy set of wheels but yeah so you're going to see a lot of these at the Bauer and here. Kind of your classic yeah. 10 speed looking bikes. Yeah so they're great, they're, they're classic so they deserve some restoration and yeah, get, totally. back, get back on the road. So the next one is the hybrid. We'll just do a quick swap. I'll let Sue bring that one in. Uh, the hybrid is uh, one of the most common um, bikes for city riding because it uses the best of both worlds of the mountain bike and the road bike. So you kind of get the beauty of the road bike, but you get all the comfort and functionality of the mountain bike. Well, this one isn't much of a looker, I have to say. <laughs> oh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, I think. It maybe has less of those classic road bike characteristics, um, but it has taken the larger wheels, the large 700C wheels, not modern alloy, uh, with a little bit of a chunkier tire as well, so a bit more It's comfort. sort of in the middle, actually. Yeah. So a little bit of tread, speed yeah. and grip. A lot of them have this even reflective kind of stripe around the tires to just give a bit more visibility in city riding, which is great. But then at the front, it kind of looks like 
It's the party up front, <laughs> business at the back. <laughs> it's the mullet bike. Yeah, it's so, the, the suspension up yeah. front, so it makes it really comfortable. Um, it's got the flat bars, um, quite a comfortable upright position. Um, good for everyday riding in the city where you've got to stop a lot at stoplights and stop signs and have your head up looking for things all the time. Yeah, um, so this is really a good example of like that kind of melding of the two styles into one. And yeah, like probably the most common modern bike that's that you would buy new is hybrid. Everyone, yeah, often people know the word hybrid, but I don't know if they know that's sort of what what you're melding together is those two characteristics. Yeah, and this yeah. one um, still in progress. Yeah, having all the uh, <laughs> cables and a bunch of things as you can see. Um, so it'll be a great bike for someone soon. Yeah. The other bike frames that we haven't mentioned, we sort of have an other category. Those are things like cruiser bikes, uh, BMXs. Um, we do get them in um, and uh, fix them up. People ride them. They're a little bit less common in the city, but um, can be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, we do have an example of like a city cruiser bike. I wanted to show that, but. Yeah, we're probably okay. Yeah. Do you have a recommendation for people in, say, the Alaska in the city of what type of bike they should be looking for? Well, it sort of depends on your needs and your area. Sydney has lots of hills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind so, of. Yeah, the number one concern I think is gearing. What's your um, what's your commute? The distance of the commute and the hilliness of it, really. Yeah. Um, um, as well, lots of people have some kind of physical limitations, you may be not as like super flexible in your back, um, so you might need to, you know, a step through something that has a lower fr um, sloping frame like this to get your leg over instead of having the straight bar where you have to put your leg over the back, mm -hmm. um, or a more upright position that works better for your neck instead of an aggressive forward leaning one where you kind of have to crank your neck up a bit that I don't love, but I know lots of people really appreciate those, find them really fun. Um, so it is quite a personal thing, um, but you do have to take into account um, what your daily commute looks like, what you're doing. If you need to carry a lot of things too, you want to have a bike that can put a rack on it or a basket so you can put your stuff on because you know in a couple months it's going to get quite hot. It's pretty sweaty carrying things on your back, so it's good to be able to put them on your bike. How do you know if it's going to be able to take a basket or something? Is there something I, you could see when looking at it? It's a great yeah. question. Yeah, great question. This is quite a good example, actually, because it's a hybrid. It's going to be more um, set up for those sorts of modern um, uh, accessories. accessories that's yeah. Uh, so one one thing you can look at in your frame is if there's um, any sort of threaded holes, basically, in the in the rear of the frame here, the rear triangle, mm -hmm. and uh, because that's one contact point for like a rear rack. Which we could just grab one out of there. For and then the second um, attachment point is usually up the top here, right closer to the, the seat. So something like this rack is going to come all the way down to one of these threaded sections and you're going to install with a bolt. This is missing the top hardware, but basically a, some sort of a strut or, or arm is going to come down and connect at these points. So uh, a lot of older road bikes will have, um, a, and sometimes older mountain bikes will have this threaded section, but maybe not something up here. Um, this is kind of the most important one though, because uh, this one you can use a, so a few clamps and things like that to attach yeah. to the frame if there's not uh, a threaded bolt section. So yeah, you're basically looking down here, you want to see some, some places where you can in, install that. And then once you get a rack, you can attach a basket to it, you can put a milk crate on it, you can zip tie, you know, a beautiful wooden box um, to make it really functional, or you can get panniers that hang off the side of the rack um, that you'll be able to take on and off with you. Yeah. The front's a little trickier. Um, front baskets tend to be less, um, uh, you're dealing with more unknown factors. I think like not all baskets will fit all bikes. Something with front suspension is usually a no-no uh, because there's no, it's not a fixed distance. It's going to move up and down with while you're riding. So your basket will hit your front tire, <laughs> yeah. which is not ideal. Uh, I think there's some disadvantages to weight on the front because you will feel it through the steering. It'll make the steering heavier, maybe feel a little more 
um, wheel unwieldy. Yeah. Uh, the benefit of w carrying weight on the back is you you sort of don't notice it. Um, but front options can be good as well. Say if your bike doesn't have um, a suitable section for you to install yeah. a rack. So. And sometimes you want both. Yeah. And sometimes you want both. So yeah. Yeah. Depends how much carrying capacity you need. So yeah. Yeah. Lots of options. Um, yeah, so I think we've discussed all our bike identification. Should we talk about some bike fit? Yeah, let's talk about bike fit. Um, so... What does that mean, bike fit? Yeah, so bike fit is, is this bike going to fit you? And how do I, if it is in the right, um, you know, sort of variation in sizing, uh, like you could still fit, you could fit, say, a medium-sized bike, but how do you make sure actually all the other things are fitting you as well? So where the saddle is, where the handlebars are, and things like that. Yeah, so but, uh, um, yeah. sometimes it's hard just to know what size bike goes to your height, and it is kind of a really specific thing. So there's actually charts that we use all the time. We're gonna pop one in the comments below um, that uh, gives you a recommendation for high, uh, bikes in your size that are mountain bikes or road bikes, and also kids' bikes. It has quite a good kids' bike on there um, chart as well. So um, we'll pop that down, and I just recommend using that. There's no kind of rule of thumb um, for sizing. We'll get you in the general area. Yeah. The other thing um, that they'll ask you or they'll talk about when you look at that chart is measurements. So we want to talk about measurements really quickly. Yeah. Um, so measurements on the bike. Or yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how do you measure the bike? Yeah. Where do you measure? <clears throat> What and are especially they talking about when they say yeah, 18 inch or yeah, 54? For sure. Yeah, and often like you'll see um, bikes for sale on Gumtree and the seller maybe lists the size, maybe doesn't. Maybe they list the size in centimeters, maybe it's in inches, like what's kind of all that mean? Or small, medium, large. So, or small, medium, large. So yeah. there's kind of using sort of three measurement systems. Um, for the most part, um, road bikes will use centimeters because um, they were designed in Europe. And uh, mountain bikes, and usually hybrids as well, because they tend to take more from that mountain bike um, approach, is in inches, because they were kind of came from North America. Uh, but mostly they're measuring the same thing, which is the distance from this middle bolt here, which where your sort of gears and pedals attach. It's normally where your yeah, uh, there's pedal usually a pedal there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this one doesn't have one yet. <laughs> so usually there's some sort of a bolt, or if there's nothing there and nothing, it's sort of from the middle, like just from the very bottom of the bike, basically. And if you have a tape measure, you're going to measure up to, and there's a few, technically sort of a few ways to, to do it. Um, but it's sort of supposed to be from the center of the, where the tubes come together and meet. Uh, but in this case, and with a lot of hybrids, where they give you this little extra bit here, they're actually measuring to the top. So this bike is 16 inches, you can see there. And I don't know if you can see on this part of the bike here. Um, oh, it has the size. Yeah, it says it says it on, the, it, it on the sticker there, 16s, and that's a small. Not one. always so lucky yeah. to get that measurement, but yeah. it's great when it's there. So modern bikes will have a little bit more information on it, and slightly higher end bikes. So um, sometimes you'll get a bike that has zero stickers on it whatsoever. So you need to do some measuring yourself. Yeah, so always a good idea if you are checking out a bike online or you go to the Bauer or something, I always try and take a tape measure um, That's a good just so I know if this bike's going to work for me. Because lots of times they don't have wheels in them, so you can't sort of do any of the little tests that uh, we'll talk about as like a real quick rule of thumb. Yeah, um, yeah. You just have a frame yeah. and yeah, it's good to measure it. Um, road bikes, because like we were saying, they have much more of a, a higher tube that kind of comes up to here. Um, did and there, the I'll just sort of demo it. But if this bike was in metric, it would be like a forty-one centimeter, which is small because of because yeah. of how low it goes. So like smaller road bikes tend to be around fifty centimeters, fifty-two mm -hmm. centimeters, fifty-four. They tend to go up in twos, um, and that's it's still measuring the same thing. But because of the style of the bike, that's just naturally going to be higher. Um, so yeah, it's essentially either where where this little top part of the frame finishes or where the tubing meets is sort of the top point. And you know, you can give or take uh, a couple of centimeters there, but yeah. Um, so that's one way to measure. I like to also measure kind of across the top here. Because it does um, vary. Yeah, because 
you sort of want to know the reach as well. Some like old road bikes are usually quite symmetrical, so they'll have like a 52 um, seat tube height, and they might have a 52 top tube height as well. So they're quite not always, but that's kind of going to give you an idea of the reach a little bit as well. So if you're looking at a bike that's you know 52 seat tube, but say 56 along the top, it just gives you an idea of like I'm just going to have to reach out further to reach my handlebars on that bike so yeah because everyone's yeah. bodies are different so some people are longer in the legs some people are longer in the torso and these are why you want to know about those measurements so that you can find something that works for your body um, yeah yeah and the other little trick that I always look at that's really easy is to just have a look at this one doesn't have any but if there's space between where this um, tube comes up and this tube comes up oh, yeah, should we get the road bike yeah you're gonna use that for your yeah, for your fit next. And that, yeah, that's a good, it's a good example yeah, of how you can just that. do a really quick look. Um, the spacing will show you if there's no space like this one, it means it's small. If you have quite a big space, it's f uh, a bigger size for a bigger body. So we'll give you show you on the um, road bike because um, it's it's pretty much my size. So we can it's a good example. If I've never done like this before at all, I don't yeah. know. You know, 52 and, and that is what like a ratio wise is there anything that I should be looking for is there any way that I can figure it out for myself yeah, yeah. so the, the charts that you mentioned that we're going to link mm -hmm. um, are they kind of give a good um, yeah they like explain yeah. the measurements and there's also yeah. you can measure your inseam your length uh, and your inseam from you know up that you do if you're getting pants um, fit um, that you can match up to those measurements that'll tell you exactly so um, yeah, so it sort of has like the road bike section, it'll say like 52 centimeters, that's small, you know, so you start to get an idea of like what that actually means, because yeah, it's just an arbitrary number up otherwise. But, yeah, so it's good to do yeah. it once for yourself, for your family, and then you sort of like have that number, and then you can use that when you're looking around. Uh, so on this one, you can see the tubes come, and there's a little bit of space, so we get kind of a, a medium-sized space here, so it's that uh, medium frame. Yeah, and we can do the measurement on this as well. Yeah. Which this is, if we go to the top, it is a 54. And so I uh, am, I know my height in feet and inches. Uh, I'm five foot seven and three quarters, five <laughs> eight, we'll be round up. Um, and I looked at the chart and I'm a 54. Yeah, which so is a medium, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So the other, um, I want to talk about the step over. Yeah, should we get this test? down? Yeah, maybe we'll move the stand. Do you want to grab the bike? Yeah. So if you don't have a tape measure, um, but you're just going to go and look at a bike or pick one up at the bower and you want to see if it's going to fit, uh, the one requirement is it does have it has to have the wheels on though. If it's just a frame, um, the measuring is going to give you a better, much better indication of the sizing. But if it does have wheels, you can do the standover check. So you're just, you know, standing over the frame, not on the saddle. And the idea is you want a bit of space between your crotch and the top bar. So uh, it's two to three inches, which is about seven, yeah, seven, five, five, five to seven, seven centimeters, yeah. or uh, two to three, three to four fingers. Just sort of get a rough measurement of the space in between, and that's. So if you are up on the saddle and you happen to fall forward, if it's too big, you could really hurt yourself. Um, so that's why you need a bit of space there. As well, when you're riding, you want to be able to move your seat post so that you can adjust it so that your leg is almost straight. So I've got a little bit of a bend. I might move this saddle up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we really, the one thing, if there's one takeaway here for bike fit, it's that size it to yourself when you're riding, not while you're just sitting on the bike. So I have a question um, yeah. from Mark. If, if you're not riding a lot, do you still need to go through this bike fit? How, how important is it to be doing that? It's uh, good to just have it generally fit you better. So I know when people first start riding, they want to be able to sit on their saddle and put their feet on the ground. And I would say, you know, you can get away with doing it for a little while, but when you're riding, no matter how little you're riding, it will cause you pain. You can get pain in your knees. Um, I have bad knees, so it's really important for me. So if your saddle is too low, 
you get a lot of pain in the back of your knee, sometimes your legs will hurt and you actually can't ride as efficiently. Um, when you have it just even in the ballpark of the right length, um, your knee will, it actually is really great for your knees and people that have knee surgery, they'll get them on the bike right away, but it fits right and it's quite good for your knee health. Um, and as well, it makes it like easier and funner to ride. So if you're only riding a little bit and it's like not comfortable, you're probably not gonna wanna do more riding. So just knowing that you can adjust your saddle up to the right height is pretty important. Um, so something, if you have your, you're doing that thing where you wanna put your feet fully on the ground, um, just do it for a little while and try to unlearn that habit and you know push yourself to move that saddle up to the correct height for your legs while you're riding. So if people want that feeling of the flat feet on the ground for stability, what are the other ways that they can achieve that? There's a really easy thing you can do and it's just hop off the saddle. Just hop off the saddle, stand over top, or there's a lot of um, curbs. You can, if you want to stay on the saddle, you can hold on to something, you can put your feet on the curb. Yeah, the curb's actually the perfect height. You just take that one foot off that's closest to it, and then, uh, yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to be on your tippy toes. So. Yeah, so, yeah, in answer to that question as well, I would say, even if you're not riding a lot, um, I would just, is the bike for you? Was it something that you picked out? It, that you know fits you, or is it a bike that you know you're borrowing or you found in the garage? You want to see if it works. This is just a good, um, a good way to understand like that that bike's going to work for you. And like Chris was saying, really saddle height is kind of the number one, or seat height um, is the number one uh, way to make sure like you're going to have a more comfortable, enjoyable ride. And super easy thing to do, even if you're borrowing a bike or your, you know, renting a bike, you've just gotten it, you can adjust your saddle height. Oh, um, yeah. How and that's, how do you do that? Yeah, great question, Sue. So there, um, there's something that will hold your seat post in back here. So it could either be a quick release valve or a bolt. Um, sometimes this one uses wrenches, but that may have a, a quick release where you just have to fold it open or an Allen key. Um, so, handy little things, um, if you're looking for a few tools to get for yourself, knowing what, um, how to adjust your, your bike, what tool you need is good one to have. I have a, another question from Camilla. If the bike frame is more like a mountain bike that isn't parallel, does that impact the standing fit or would they do it the same way? Great question, Great Camilla. Great question, Camilla. Um, it does, so you actually get a bigger space in between. Yeah. So uh, on the bike chart, uh, I think it gave an extra inch, which is another three centimeters to look for in between. So that hybrid that we had that had sloped down a bit, yeah. you just get a little bit more extra space on that standover. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the saddle is the, the first thing I always adjust when looking at bike fit. Yeah. Um, do the standover test. Um, sit on the saddle, put your foot down to six o'clock, see how your leg looks, maybe have a little test ride. Um, might be something you might test a couple times to just fiddle around and get to the perfect height. Uh, as well, the other thing uh, is you want your saddle parallel to the ground. So uh, it can be quite uncomfortable if it's pointed up or pointed down. Um, ideally, when you start, have it parallel um, and you could even go just ever so slightly down. A lot of people find quite comfortable. And uh, on saddles, we want to talk a little bit about saddles because they are not all made uh, the same. <laughs> There's quite a variety in saddles and often that's the one thing when you buy, even if you buy a new bike, they'll put a cheap saddle on and they can be really hard, really uncomfortable and they're so easy to swap out. Yeah, so we're gonna go into contact points, um, which is co covers saddles, which is, yeah, saddles, handlebars, or saddles or seats, handlebars, um, and pedals is in there too. We're not really gonna go into those much, but those are the three contact points of the bike. So those are the three areas that you may find discomfort, or you can improve things, or... or um, easy, to, easy to change. Yeah, you can change things out, or you can um, like modify things a little bit. So here's some good examples of like, and often you, if you buy a new bike, um, it's really common to get a saddle like this on it. 
and you think, geez, bike riding is like so horrifically uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> and yeah, this saddle is going to be really, really uncomfortable um, because it's basically, it's, there's nothing really there. So um, this is what we'd probably call like um, a men's road saddle or like racing saddle. Um, we usually don't gender many things, but saddles is kind of the one I guess they're sold as a gendered product. Yeah, it's maybe, yeah, they are sold as a gendered product. It doesn't necessarily mean that that is or isn't right for you. Um, but generally speaking, what that would mean is a men's saddle is going to be longer. It's going to have a longer nose and very narrow um, section at the back here. Um, because they're sort of designed for you to never be on them. Like a road saddle, you're not, you your, your, your weight is a lot more forward. You're sort of not even supposed to sit on these things. Or if you do, you have a lot of padding, you know, you're wearing Lycra. So comfort is zero on these. It's for like <laughs> speed, I guess, and uh, aggressive position. Yeah, high performance or something, I don't know. So if you have a saddle like this on your bike and it feels horrible, then yes, that, that, that is the case. Yeah. So you could go for something more like this. This is a bit more, and I'll show you side by side just to sort of, you can see how much wider the other side this saddle is. Um, so this is probably in the unisex territory or maybe it would be classed as a women's saddle. Um, I'm not really sure, but it's just basically a wider section here at the back. And that's because women sort of technically have wider sit bones. Uh, so it's a physiological thing. Again, it's not always the case, like your body might be, might be different. But if you just generally speaking, you're going to have a wider section at the back for your sit bones. This has got like gel padding a little bit, uh, and it has got a cutaway section in the middle here. So there's a s sort of a bit in the middle that's missing. It's not it's not sort of flush over the top. There's sort of a cut in section. Yeah. And what's that for, Chris? Would you say? Uh, well, <laughs> the main reason that they developed the cutaway is so that you don't have what's known as genital mash. <laughs> which is a very painful thing uh, where you're sitting, you know, right on yourself and uh, sort of gives you the ability to float in the middle, gives you that... Um, Just a bit more room, you know? Yeah, a bit, bit more, more space yeah. and those like really like sensitive points aren't pushing down on something quite hard. Yeah. So this you'd see on like um, hybrid bikes, mountain bikes, touring bikes. Anything. Anything really. really you can put this saddle on any type of bike. Yeah. yeah, and this is, we have a whole box of them here of different kinds of saddles. This is one that we've just pulled out. Yeah. Uh, we also have uh, what's known as a comfort saddle. Um, so these are quite so attractive. That's like the widest of the three. Yeah. yeah. Comfort saddles are uh, unisex. Um, you tend to see them, they come on like cruiser bikes, Dutch bikes, bigger upright positioning. Uh, they often have a bit of spring in the back. They're real thick. Tons of cushioning, uh, very comfortable. Because um, all that weight, that higher positioning, which is comfortable, means that all your weight is on, you're sitting on all your weight. Yeah. The more you move forward down the bike, the more the weight starts to distribute through the front and through the arms. Um, but yeah, so the saddle is gonna, the more and more you sit back, the bigger and bigger the saddle's gonna get, basically. Yeah. Great, so maybe we'll talk a bit about um, handlebars and stem positioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've done saddle, so that's your one contact point. Again. Oh yeah, great. So um, second contact point would be uh, handlebars. Are there any other types of seats, or is it really just those three? Um, I mean, you can get all sorts of different um, <coughs> materials. I guess a lot of stuff is, um, I guess, plastic or I don't know. Most of these saddles are sort of made out of some sort of a plastic, mm -hmm. but you can also get like leather, like leather saddles like this. Um, they take a lot of time to break in, but arguably are some, some of the most comfortable saddles, but it depends if, if you like them. This one's kind of got springs at the back as well for extra cushioning and support. They tend to um, last longer as well. Yeah, so they last a long time. If you break it in, you really get a comfortable saddle, but you expect to pay more if you buy that new. Um, great find, you can get it second hand and they can be re-oiled and yeah, yeah. some of them have um, threading underneath so you can pull it tighter and lace it up and redo it so that's a really cool refurbish. Um, yeah, let the, something let like this could totally be refurbished. Yeah. yeah, it might last you 30 years if you look after it. So Yeah, easily. Um, yeah, but so. yeah, that's mostly what we're seeing. Yeah, so, so yeah, you have this sort of suede finish as well. 
Yeah, they're kind of annoying. They tend to hold moisture when it gets wet, so I would avoid those. You can get a cover. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I just, you know, put a plastic bag, have one stuffed underneath my saddle here so you can pull it up with rainy and just pop it on top. Um, even a shower cap is great. Oh, I've yeah, seen a yeah. lot of people use a shower cap because it has the elastic underneath. So, yeah. Um, and there's a little pocket under here you can just stuff it in. Which is yeah, great. that's a good tip. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so bars. Talking about bars. Yeah, bars and stems. So, when we say stems, what we're talking about is the part that holds the handlebars. And um, there are a couple types of stems. So we have um, some examples of them here. There are uh, adjustable, ones that are more adjustable and less adjustable. So the quill stem. Oh, or, I'll just show you oh, yeah, an example. One. So to demystify a bit what's happening here, um, this is kind of your your fork here, and then this whole silver, the yeah, this whole silver section of the fork is what you don't see. It's inside the tubing at the front of the bike. So when you have a stem like this, it's just a threadless system. Um, this is sort of the maximum, or the way you can position the height is basically how much of this silver section you have on your fork. So often these bikes are at the highest point. And there's nowhere really to go from there. But that's sort of, we just wanted to show you what it looked like underneath. Because um, you might not know that the fork and the frame are actually separate parts. So they get um, held in together um, through the headset, which helps your front wheel turn. Um, and then at the top of it is your stem, which holds your handlebars. So uh, with that one that we were looking at, that's a threadless. Yeah. Um, and it's, like Sue said, the height is set. So this one has been cut. There's actually a couple spacers in here. Then the yeah. So you could go lower and by changing the spacer order, but you, you can't go higher. You're at the, you're yeah, at the top position. You'll have a little bit sticking out the top. This is technically an adjustable stem, so you can adjust the angle it's of it. Got this um, um, key point there that you could bring that in a little closer. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So what were you? Yeah, some stems will have adjustability here with with this this bolt, and sometimes there's one underneath here that you have to loosen. But a lot of stems do just come set like this. So this is a, a part that can be changed out for something that's. Shorter, longer, more angled, angle. less angled. Um, so you get a little bit of adjustability there, but um, it's a great system, but that's the only sort of flaw to it is there's less maneuverability in the height. For the up and down, yeah. So the, the other one is a threaded or a quill stem, and that one has the ability to move up and down a bit. Um, so you can also get them in different lengths. You can swap them out so you can have a longer um, reach on the front or shorter reach. Um, so a lot of old road bikes are going to come with a stem like this. This is a quill cool stem. Mm -hmm. And the threading that Chris was mentioning, that's a, about how the connection with the, um, the headset system, which is basically how your fork attaches to the bike, and there's threading here. Um, so again, you won't see this. If this is installed in the bike, you won't see this, but you will see um, the stem. And so the, the benefit to this system is there's adjustability up and down inside that steering tube here. Um, so yeah, you have a bit more... Um, your handlebars yeah, up. Yeah, a bit more yeah. options for height. Yeah. Um, like most things though, anything that slides within uh, another section of the bike, like saddle or a stem, is going to have something called a minimum insertion and that's going to have a line and saying something like max on it. So there is limitations because you can see this is a wedge system, this is a wedge bolt at the bottom. So you, yeah, you're going to want to pay attention to things like that so you don't exceed the safe, safe height. So that would just mean if you were, yeah, installing this, I couldn't run it any higher than that, but I could run it lower. Yeah, really higher. good thing to have a quick yeah. look at. It's something that we see and we always feel nervous for people if it's your saddle or your stem is past the minimum insertion, you're at risk for it actually could you know break yeah. off or bend forward. So um, a really good thing to check. Um, also those two things, they have grease on them, that's normal. Um, yeah. That makes it, um, keeps it uh, good to move up and down so you don't get any seizing. Yeah. Um, actually, it's one good thing to note as well, if you are picking up a bike from the Bower or off the side of the road or you find one in the garage, um, 
the seed post and the stem, especially the quill stem system like that, are the two main points that we check for seizing. So if those two things don't move, because uh, we're talking about fit here, like the, the frame size being one, one element of that, but if your seat post and your stem don't move, um, or you can't unseize them through a variety of methods, there's ways to try and get them unstuck, but um, that's kind of a bit of a red flag of whether you should proceed with either riding the bike or fixing up the bike, um, because it, it will affect the overall fit and comfort and sort of safety as well. Like if the bike seat is too high and you can't get it down, like that's gonna yeah, and it's dangerous. the first thing we look at yeah. on bikes when we're triaging them. If those things are seized, we go through our procedure of trying to get them unseized. If not, we get rid of it because it's actually a safety thing and um, not really worth the time because it's only you know going to fit that one exact person that has that um, that that set, uh, yeah yeah that set height. So um, should we do our quick ABC check? Yeah, let's do an ABC sure. check. Sure. So um, we've got. The beautiful Levente. Oh yeah, that let's bring that out. Suze yeah. has actually uh, finished building this week. Um, what is an ABC check? An ABC check is a really quick check that you can do uh, every time you get on your bike. I do it every day, uh, and it stands for air, brakes, and chain. So, the air we're talking about air in your tires, in your uh, in these guys, in your wheels. So. Um, First thing I do is just give them a little squeeze. So you'll be able to tell uh, if they're deflated, if you've got a flat tire, it's very apparent. Uh, yeah, you're not gonna end up to... halfway down the street and realize you've got a flat tire and be like, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the bane of our existence as cyclists is flat tires. So um, wanna check that before you get on your bike. So just give it a quick squeeze. Um, you can also tell maybe your air pressure is a bit low. It's something they recommend that you um, top up like every month. Um, and a common thing um, to that most people don't know is that actually your tire tells you how much to pump uh, it up to. So we've got a close up of this on the tire. It's actually written on the side of the tire. So and these, yeah, these numbers relate to the, the size, the dimensions of the tire that you have, all these sort of numbers. And then this, usually on the other side, it's going to give you your inflation information. So this says inflate to min 2.5 bar, which is 35 PSI, max 4.5 bar, which is 65 PSI. So it's going to tell you on your tire what your inflation should be. And uh, I look at the PSI, that's your pounds per square inch. So when you're looking at your pump, most pumps have a gauge on them, not all of them but the gauge yeah. will um, show you the number so you can match up to know how much to pump it up to. Yeah, so that inner ring is the bar, the one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the outer ring is the PSI, 20, 40, 60, 80, that sort of thing. And the smaller your tires are, the higher you have to pump it up, the higher the pressure, the wider they are, the bigger they are, the lower the number. So if you have car tires, they're at like 40, 50, they're quite low. If you have a, a small road bike tire, they can be up to like 120. And the two valve types you're going to come across is a Presta valve. This is, I remember it because this section presses in and out. This is the top of the valve. Um, if you are inflating these tires, you have to wind that either in or out. So in is sort of locking it in, keeping the air in. Out, you can now pump your tire up. Oh, whole valve came out. <laughs> uh, these are often on road bikes or high pressure tires. But you're seeing them more and more on like hybrid bikes, and often this is the one that maybe people haven't come across before, uh, because this is more the more common Schroeder valve or auto valve that you're going to see on like um, uh, mountain bikes, and it's usually for larger, lower pressure tires. But these are the two valve types. Usually pumps are going to have um, like this pump has a dual head system, so one side is going to be for Presta, one side for Schroeder. And hopefully they tell you not, uh, again, it's, there's variety in pumps. Um, on this one, you can, you can sort of look and see the hole. It's usually a bit bigger on the Schrader side, a little bit skinnier on the Presta side. So when you go to pump it up, you would just kind of jam it on there, get it in as far as you can, and then on this one it moves to the opposite side. And then you put both your feet on the pump, and go for it and get it up to, this one's working quite well, and get it up to pressure. Um, and usually those last few pumps will give you a bit of a workout, that's good. 
Um, but yeah, you want to keep that those pumped up because it definitely having your tires up to pressure makes it easier to ride. If you start feeling like, oh, I'm so out of shape or it's like really hard to ride, you've probably got low tire pressure. It's not you. So check your tire pressure. Um, and the B is for brakes. Yeah. So on this beautiful Levente that Sue's finished up last week, um, it's got these drop bars and you can just really easy, just give your brakes a squeeze just to make sure that they're working. Here, you know, give your bike a shake. They're actually working. And um, on this, the little rule of thumb is that you want your levers to come in about halfway, about parallel to your bars. So that's the ideal spot that they'll sit. See on this one, they come in. If you're coming in all the way and your levers hit your handlebars, you're not gonna have much stopping power. So you really want to um, make sure you've got a bit of room there. And then on the other end, sometimes they're, something's seized or it's too tight and you can't move the levers at all, especially for um, you know, folks with smaller hands or not a lot of hand strength, kids. You know, you have to be able to pull that lever in to get your stopping. So if it's too tight, that's also not going to work. So yeah. that's a good check. And sometimes it's just, oh, something's popped out. Maybe you pop it back in if you say moved your bike in the car or something like that. And and then C is the last one, which is chain. And it's usually just you're just going to listen for like any weird sounds um, because usually you just sort of pick the back up, drop it, and usually the only thing you can hear is the chain kind of snapping. If you're hearing anything else rattling or like weird sounds, um, it's, something might be loose. So like your rack, your, some, one of your rack bolts might have come loose and that's going to be dangerous if you ride off into traffic and your rack goes into your wheel. Um, but yeah, the ABC check is like, really you get your bike out, squeeze, squeeze, brakes are good, drop the chain and you're good to go. It's kind of that. Um, yeah, takes really maybe not even 10 seconds, but. You, we should be doing that every time we go down to get on our bikes. Yeah. When you drop it like that, you describe the chain as snapping. What does that sound? Yeah, it's so what happens is the derailleur kind of comes down and then does that. It's okay. sort of a weird sound to get used to, but like you're going to hear sound when you do the, the drop, but you're just trying to, and if, you, if you're doing sounds. it every day, you'll yeah. start to hear if like something sounds different or it, yeah, it's sort of a hard one to describe, but you're just gonna hear the chain kind of snapping. And if there's another sound, you'll hear maybe a, a horrible clinking sound of your <laughs> fender uh, bolt has come out or your rack has come out. Um, and then it's good to go in for a closer investigation and sort of see where that bolt's loose and you can just tighten it up. And yeah. it's a really easy thing to do that is a big safety um, thing that will, you know, the last thing you want is your wheel or your rack, uh, your um, fender coming off into your wheel when you're riding. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is a sound to kind of get used to. I mean, another thing could be to pick the back of the bike up, put a foot on the pedal and just give it a quick turn because if there's, often if like gears get changed while the bike's stationary or something and when you go to ride off, it's like clunk, 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 clunk and you're changing like five gears because, um, so that's another quick thing you could do would just be a quick spin of the, the wheel and then drop. And that's just going to make sure everything's moving, your, your gears are in position and yeah, ready to you're go. Not hearing anything weird. What yeah. would be the major hazard signs? Like something was seriously wrong with it and you shouldn't ride it? What would be. <clears throat> I mean, the, tire. Yeah, the ABC is really for yeah. like you're riding this bike fairly regularly and you're just. I think the main thing really is tires and like tire pressure. Yeah, like yeah. you've got a flat tire. You wouldn't believe the number of times you like get on your bike and you're literally. You've ridden down the road the a little way and then you're like, why does it feel so, uh, and then you look down and you've got a, a flat in the in the back. So it's to try try and stop that from happening because you can damage rims and things like that. Uh, you can damage parts of the bike if you ride on a flat. So it's to sort of try and um, just, yeah, mainly flat tires. Troubleshoot it before you get going. Yeah. Or if something's come loose that isn't meant to be. Yeah. Um, for bikes that haven't been ridden or have been stored for a long time, ABC is kind of where you would start, but then most likely you're going to have to go into more diagnostics and steps, which yeah, you know, it looks like uh, they're going to cover a bit more in the yeah. workshop in two weeks. But yeah, so if you're um, doing your air is okay, and then on your brakes, if you squeeze them, they're not feeling normal. Um, you might feel yeah, one brake doesn't feel the same as the other because you usually want them to feel the same. So if one side feels weird, 
um, all of a sudden it's really loose. That's when I'd kind of follow the cable down. Oh, maybe something's got knocked out of place. Um, or, you know, brakes can open up in the back. Oh, it's open, it shouldn't be like this. And because there's two of them, you can kind of compare one side to the other, which is really nice. If you don't really know what you're looking for, um, you can just say, oh, the back one looks different than the front one. Something's fine, I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, this isn't right, I know that's not normal. Um, and, and especially if you transport bikes in cars a lot and maybe you're taking off wheels, putting wheels back on, um, yeah, it's a good way to just check everything's back to where it should be. Yeah, because they can really easily um, get moved out of alignment and they're rubbing against the frame. Um, and you think, oh my gosh, my wheel's not turning, I can't, I can't ride. Um, just have a look down at where you've connected your, your wheel into the frame. Um, undo it, and we like to stand it on the ground. Undo it, stand it on the ground, that often will put it straight back into the frame, do it back up, and test it again. Yeah. Yeah, so the other um, kind of common thing uh, with your chain, so we talked about the racks and the fenders coming loose, um, you can get a rusty chain, um, and that, uh, we haven't talked about that today, but uh, cleaning your chain on a regular basis is uh, really handy to just sort of keep efficiency, especially we've had a fair bit of rain lately, yeah. your chain can pick up all the dirt and grime on the, the road, so if you oil your chain, um, the big thing is to use your rag, wipe off the excess because it's kind of like glue, it'll just pick up more stuff and then your bike gets really dirty in the back. So um, having a good look at your whole chain drive system, giving it a wipe down, cleaning it off, um, can be quite satisfying picking all that stuff off. I like doing that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And giving it another re-oil, wiping off the excess, um, just doing that on a regular basis helps your chain life last longer, helps it feel better to ride. Just easier and funner and that's always the goal. What kind of oil do you use for that? Um, you can use any sort of um, chain oil. We've got um, some just behind you there on the shelf. Yeah, there's like Triflow. Some people use Triflow, but that's a little on the heavier side. Um, you can use, well, like Park Tool do their own one. Um, Shimano has their own one, one too. Yeah, I think so those we, ones have get them in bulk. Those have Triflow in them, but there's other, um, there's loads of other brands. Any bike shop will have like chain, chain oil or chain lube, um, and it's specifically for yeah. bikes. Um, Here's just some couple of examples, but um, yeah. So I, I do not recommend putting. Um, don't put WD40 on it. Don't put WD40 <laughs> yeah. on it. Actually, dries out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your bike, which you don't want, you want to keep it lubed and moving well. Um, uh, you know, in an extreme emergency, I've heard of the old olive oil going on. Not great for regular maintenance. Just pop yeah. these are like ten bucks at a bike shop, or you know. Yeah, there's loads of different brands different and different sports stores. They often just carry yeah. these. We have a question about motor oil or like a car oil. Would that be acceptable to use on a chain? Uh, it's probably a little too heavy and viscous. Like bike or uh, bike chain oils are usually actually quite light because they're more for like frequent use. Um, because actually, even after you, it rains, usually like you've most of the lubricant has gone out of the chain, um, just from general use and from water. So, because it's something you do frequently, um, like again, like Chris was saying, maybe if you had a, like exceptionally rusty chain and you're just really trying to get it going, it might be okay in an emergency. But usually, motor rolls are just they're too heavy, um, and they're quite thick yeah. with multi-geared bikes. So the thing is, if you have a single-speed bike, you can. There are thicker uh, oils because it doesn't have to run through the derailleur. Mm, but yeah. if you have a multi-geared bike, which most people do, especially in Sydney, because you got to get up hills, you want you need that oil to be thin so it can go through all the components and move easily and not get gunked up in between. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's why I would be worried about with motor oil. Yeah, it's probably a bit a bit heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, do we have any other questions? Yeah, any other questions? No, no, not really. Is there any final things? Like if, if you're really, you're looking, you're picking up a bike, you see it on the side of the road, or you, you're going to the bower, is there any major mm. things that people should really be wary of or looking for? Like if you were to just kind of run down a list. Yeah, so first one, uh, you want to make sure it fits you, right? Because that fit is the most important. Um, I guess number two, if you're doing sort of a quick diagnosis, uh, kind of having a good look at the components that are there, you know, you might, um, some things are just totally rusted, you know, because if you're doing it yourself, you've got to replace those things out, so sort of what your own capacity is to do that, um, where you come in somewhere, um, like coming in here, uh, or in our, you know, 
the repair cafe workshops, we have some of those parts, uh, new and used stuff, you can change them out. Um, do the ABC check on it, like squeeze the brakes. Yeah. Um, if they don't, the brakes aren't working, often it's just you're replacing out cable and housing, which is a pretty easy thing to do. Yeah, which is like these, these external parts here. Yeah, an old bike that's maybe a bit rusty will have, a lot, the surface rust is mainly going to be on chain and say cables and housing, so things like the brakes and then the, the pedals, pedals are going to be affected, but it doesn't necessarily mean that like they're broken and not working because it's just those connection points, the chain connecting the drivetrain together, the cable and housing connecting like the brakes to the levers. Those are the most common things to rust up and, and sort of seize, but those they're quite an easy replacement. I guess the other thing yeah. I always look for is that it has a bottom bracket, which is where this part down here, where your cranks go in. Sometimes you'll see a beautiful frame, but it doesn't have that part in it, which is a little bit trickier to put in, can be a bit more expensive. Yeah. So that's always just a quick thing that I do glance at, to see if that's there. Um, so like this one doesn't have the pedals. Pedals are easy to replace, but um, the crank is can be a bit harder. Um, give it a spin, maybe give it a shake. See how loose it is, what kind of shape it's in. Um, move thing, you know, if you can move the, the front fork, sort of get an idea if it's yeah, if the, it's gonna yeah. run with sort of minimal. Yeah, like the uh, more stuff that's it. on the bike, the better. So if it has wheels, great. If it has components, great. Even if all those things are rusted, it'll give you a reference of what they you're then looking for to replace. It's harder with just like a frame with nothing on it that you sort of have no gauge. Yeah, um, fun to yeah. do for a long-term project. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe a little bit uh, yeah, more investment yeah. work. Um, so and yeah, like Chris was saying, the things that are supposed to turn and, and rotate often will become loose, uh, like you know steering or bottom brackets, things like that. Or um, sometimes your wheels will go out of true, or there will be wobble in the in the hubs in the in the wheels. Like the yeah, there'll just be looseness basically through the wheel. Um, and then other things seize up, so cable housing chain. So things get yeah. too tight or too loose, but all those things usually are either adjustable or replaceable. And we uh, and always just as long as there's no little... frame, as long as there's no damage to the frame. Yes, it's like yeah, because often bikes are donated because they've been in a front end collision, which then the frame is compromised and it's not safe to ride. It could break apart at you at any time. So a really easy place to look is just under here. That's often so if you're, you know, go bang into a car or something like that, you'll get like a, a ripple in the paint or in the frame will often buckle in this spot and just also in the joints. Have a look that there's no cracks um, or, yeah, rippling in the paint is a good um, sort of thing to notice. So that's a really quick to sort of check over. Um, yeah, so I would say that usually a reason why they end up in here um, <laughs> yeah. you just got to find that reason and hopefully it's something you can repair yeah yeah I'm just gonna jump in real quick yeah as a well, in the middle um, thank you very much that was oh, fantastic. Thanks for having us. and a really good place to start bikes as well so um, as we're going forward we've been doing these with with woodworking and electrical you know, last week was clothing and this week bikes and in two weeks again we're coming back and we're meeting up with the Bowers team uh, Stu and Kieran to continue on from this so you know, if you're finding that bike at the bower and you've done these checks and you notice maybe it needs a little bit or it, it's the right size and shape but something needs to be done, Stu and Kieran are going to start to talk about the things that you need to have to be able to do those things um, and what sort of things you can start doing on your own. It's going to be really cool. Mm. Um, in, I think in the end of September, starting in August, we're starting to go back to some live in-person things. Um, our SEC courses, woodworking courses, are going back to like actual in-person stuff, which we're really excited about. And eventually we're gonna come back to doing some repair cafes as well. Awesome. Which would be really cool. If you don't know, we used to do these repair cafes um, at the Bower and then at our wood shop and also at our electrical repair shop. And I don't, did you do a few? Yeah, we did about five months uh, before things got closed down. Third yeah. Saturday of the month at the Vanga location in the electrical shop. Uh, we pulled out front there and had all our stands and tools. It was really fun. Um, on Saturday afternoons. Yeah, yeah. So those are coming back later this year if all goes well. <laughs> Stay safe, everyone. Um, and our, our in-person workshops. But we're also working, continuing to do these sort of online things and continuing to grow these. I think it's really nice. We can reach so many different people that we can't normally, which is fantastic. So we're running some um, courses with Sydney Community College online soon as well. If you have anything that you have questions about, feel free to 
chuck them in, in the comments on this. Um, or email us um, if there's something specific you you've got a bike and you just want a quick chat with someone We do run one-on-one -on -one consultations. We do that with all of our departments in two weeks will be the next bike one And that'll be with Stu and Kieran. So book in for that um, Yeah, next week is electrical repair. So next week we're going cool. back to the electrical workshop with um, with Griffin and, and Andre so that's gonna be fun I'm not actually sure what they're covering next week. We're <laughs> I did my first one. And it was great. Yeah. Clean my toaster right away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Um, anything else you want to add before we close up? Uh, we are at bicyclegarden.com. You can find us on Facebook. Um, feel free to also hit us up with any questions. We take donations. Um, that we are fixing up and right now because we're closed to the public we're giving those donations away to essential workers or anyone who can't access any support during this COVID time which is a lot of people that want to you know they need to go to work whatever that looks like for them they don't want to be on public transportation as well we also um, give bikes away to asylum seekers refugees women escaping domestic violence which have been really hard hit uh, during this time um, a lot of organizations aren't open it's kind of limited so uh, yeah we're really trying to support them so that's what happens to those bikes that you give to us or we do fundraising and give money to those organizations so yeah so that's where we're at and stay tuned we'll be able to uh, we don't really know when we'll back up to the public again um, but just keep an eye on our Facebook page Sweet. all right and definitely swing by the Bower if you're looking for second-hand bikes or, or talk to the people at Bicycle Garden yeah thank you all very much and Great. we'll see you next week in the electrical department thanks have you clicked the buttony button Oh, oh.